Let's start with the uh, second half. That is new product development. And the keywords here are extensions, uh, line extensions, and associated transfers. Uh, as you may remember from previous lectures, associated transfer is uh, the very one of the very key words that must be kept at the back of your minds at all times. As far as we're concerned, mainly when we're talking about either investing in a promotion program or um, distribution pricing, what kind of associated transfers may be affected from a channel, uh, from a price point, from a mother brand, to our new loans. So these are very, very important issues. This is why I'll be spending um, quite some time in explaining uh, what kind of associated transfers we will concerned with in the case of land extensions, which is also the focus of your assignment. And this will affect, this will affect will lead us uh, until the end of the second part of uh, today's lecture. Uh, I will start with uh, a very uh, traditional uh, growth planning matrix as regards to growth development and discerning growth opportunities for brands. This is the ASO matrix. The ASO matrix consists of four quadrants, as you can see in this graph. And these quadrants reflect different uh, combinations between uh, product and market. Mm -hmm. Starting from uh, the upper left, this is the case of um, existing markets and existing products. And the uh, recommended strategy, according to ASO, in this configuration is market penetration. Uh, that is uh, trying to augment uh, our, our market share in a market. Uh, most likely, this is a growing market. And uh, the MPV rate is also likely to be low, uh, but the problem intensity is uh, likely to be high. Moving on to uh, towards the right of the upper right quadrant. This is the configuration of existing markets with new products. Uh, this is one of the territories that you might leverage in your assignment as well. Real product development. For example, use a brand, but for an, for an existing segment, or an extension of a current sub brand. For example, new variants based on size, label, scent, benefit. For example, Coke Zero or Vanilla. The um, bottom left quadrant, this is the configuration of um, investing in new markets with uh, existing products. Uh, a typical case in this scenario is a position of an existing product offer uh, that is um, quite usual in the OTC drugs market. Uh, for example, repositioning an existing drug for different conditions. So, well, multiple conditions at the same time. And finally, moving on to the bottom right quadrant. Uh, this is the configuration of new products with new markets. This is the most, uh, let's say, augmented position related, or if you remember the concentric circles in terms of positioning that I presented in the first lecture, the potential product territory. There's the furthest, the uh, more far out, um, territories you can leverage for extending your uh, your brand by diversifying it um, either in wholly irrelevant markets or in semi-relevant markets. Now what is wholly relevant, irrelevant and semi-relevant or relevant are quite flexible and uh, fluctuating terms that have been defined in all sorts of different ways in the secondary literature. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, a completely different market um, in product terms, strictly in product related terms, uh, is a market that you don't have uh, any know how and you can invest in, and that is at the same time completely different because of use and uh, um, uh, the mode of use. For example, um, diversifying from uh, airplanes to hotels. Now, what this kind of definition for diversification does not take into account 
is exactly what I was stressing in, in the same respect in previous lectures, the secondary brand associations, which are more important for us. For example, hotels and airplanes may, may sound quite dissonant and quite different, but when it comes to Virgin, extending towards either category is very well expected for reasons that I am not going to explain anew. I went through this uh, reasoning in the first lecture. You may play back the uh, uh, equivalent uh, presentation. But uh, what you should be born in mind is that diversification is a, flex it's a flexible term. And that is, uh, at least as regards the answer of matrix, it's product oriented rather than brand oriented. And uh, even less so when we're concerned with leveraging secondary brand associations. Uh, this is why I kept coming back uh, with uh, not a response to Mr. Um, I think it was Mr. Odopoulos or um, a question, anyways, that was proposed earlier uh, in these lectures as regards whether McDonald's, for example, uh, would be um, uh, capable of launching successfully an apparel brand. Uh, to which I told you that there is no right and wrong, and there is, there is literally no limit as regards the uh, stretch of the brand. It all depends on the assumptions you make about your markets, your segments, and of course your brand, uh, how stretchable it is. Uh, and of course the resources and competencies, and whether you can break into a new market. Now, what are the benefits of running sessions? Uh, first and foremost, it's a, a risk reduction mechanism when it comes to product choice. Um, corporate brands may lack specific associations because of the brands of products that are attached to the name, uh, which means that uh, overall they uh, constitute hallmarks that are improving consumer's memory and that aid them in making automatically choices. Well, as I passed by different shelves. So, um, as a risk reduction mechanism, uh, uh, an extension uh, is very important because it draws on the mother brand name and it's uh, an automatically uh, seal of guarantee and a way of transferring positive associations, especially as regards trust uh, and esteem. Uh, they uh, have increased the probability of people listing with major retailers. Uh, they have uh, increased efficiencies as regards promotional expenditures. For example, it has been found that 10% average advertising sales ratio for brand extensions compared to 90% uh, advertising sales ratio for new brands. So brand name plays a very important role. Uh, and the reduced cost of introductory and product marketing programs. In so far as uh, when brand becomes associated with multiple products, advertising uh, can spread out uh, across categories uh, and for the family brand as a whole. As you can see, the entire environment per se, it generates a block effect. Uh, size matters when it comes to brand extensions uh, uh, in terms of creating a block on shelf. Uh, the size and centrality of a block stick with different variables uh, under the same some brand name signals the relative salience of the brand for its category. It's like progress in front of a shelf and a uh, second brand uh, with uh, 10 faces. Next to it, a uh, brand with two faces, vertically, uh, you automatically associate the block effect of the uh, more sizable uh, brand with uh, a greater salience and importance that is important for the category. So it tells you that perhaps it's a more popular brand it's a brand that people like me trust more than the brand with only the faces. Uh, it Therefore, it has the probability of consumer choice. We'll consider it a very common uh, And at the same time, they attend to know consumers inside the brand franchise. That is, uh, the more um, extensions you launch, the more you uh, throw consumers from switching. Uh, to competitive offers, 
And by retaining them within the same uh, sub brand or part of brand uh, franchise. Uh, they are for to strengthen brand meaning. Uh, as you may recall, due to either competitive uh, dynamics or macrocultural issues, brand meaning tends to erode and shift. The more you launch extensions, the more you manage to uh, justify uh, your uh, salaries for consumers, but you, ma you matter to consumers. Most importantly, it's a way of enhancing the brand or brand image. The same goes for brand image. Um, if left unattended and uh, that is bereft of uh, new extensions of new blood that's pouring into the base of the franchise, it's going to uh, erode, it's going to become sedimented. So according to our main model, CBB, uh, it's a desirable outcome, successful brand, uh, to enhance the brand, brand, brand image by improving the favorability of existing associations with new uh, extensions, adding new brand associations, for example, for new use, mode of usage, uh, new segments, new aesthetics, and uh, all a combination of the above. This is the case of revitalizing the brand especially the parent brand. And of course, depending on the way of subsequent extensions, for example, when Apple introduced the iPod, it quickly became a market leader representing one of the company's most successful new products. At the same time, when we launched uh, the iPod, it named the introduction of the iPhone smartphone and the iPad tablet computer. So a successful extension is a springboard for um, more extensions to come. Of course, uh, apart, as always, apart from the benefits, there are risks that are associated with grand accessions. For example, uh, cause consumer frustration in the face of greater variety uh, on shelf, uh, especially nowadays, uh, as I was talking about um, uh, previous week, the more uh, prolific in category in terms of variants, uh, the more consumers tend to confuse with all the different benefits and added values uh, that are um, uh, purported by brands as they try to micro segment their markets and reap benefits from ever uh, multiplying niche, uh, niches. Um, for example, consumers may reject new extensions uh, for trying to test their favorites of full purpose versions, uh, just because they want to, uh, they don't intend to become immense in this complexity, uh, it overburdens the decision making. Uh, occasionally, retailers are resistant to the phenomenon of variance proliferation because it causes self space scarcity. It must frequent assortment revisions and the enactment of rationalization programs. Uh, these are joint activities that are usually undertaken um, between the between retail, retailers and manufacturers. That is, um, they undertake the review of the category, especially with uh, leading players in this category, in order to rationalize their assortment and the allocation of sales rates. So they're slow moving schedules, their uh, medium moving schedules, fast moving schedules. Not all the schedules are the same, and the slower the schedule moves, the greater uh, it sits idle on shelf, and the turnover rate is not profitable enough for the retailer. So as a result, it has become virtually impossible for a grocery store or a supermarket to offer all of the different varieties available across all various brands in any product category. This is why a listing of new, product, uh, new products uh, usually takes place in a scalable fashion, that is a start uh, depending on how niche a new product is. Starting with hypers at large, which tend to get more schedules, that report extended assortment, and gradually, depending on uh, their uh, take off from consumers, move on to medium and small selling, small selling points. This is very important for uh, 
the distribution part of your assignment. Uh, you will have to justify uh, on which retail type you will target for the first year your new loans. Uh, for example, you might come up with a niche proposal, in which case you might say, based on this background information, we will look for medium to small points. Uh, so we will, we will opt for the first year only for hybrids and large. And we shall revise our uh, distribution policy as of uh, second year. Uh, moreover, retailers only feel that many land extensions are uh, me too. So uh, they don't feel particularly compelled in allocating shop space uh, to um, perhaps an important competitor, yet who hasn't any uh, extravagantly uh, relevant new news for, for the category. Um, Fed land extensions are bound to her pretty much. In the majority of cases, if a land extension uh, fails miserably, uh, it will have an impact on uh, the main brand image, or the part of brand image. Um, especially when we're concerned with functional aspects. This is the inverse picture uh, as with reference to what I have been you know, um, um, explained so far that is the more you leverage secondary brand associations and the more you move into an ESP territory that is emotional uh, salute point, uh, the more you can uh, nurture uh, loyalty long term. Uh, the exactly opposite scenario holds for brand failures. Uh, brand failure, if, it's a, if the failure is attributed to not coming across as credible with regard to secondary brand association, it will be much less detrimental. Okay, fair enough, it didn't match our intended um, audience in terms of uh, uh, being a family brand. But if there is a major defect uh, in, the, in the functional makeup uh, of, of the product, then it is far more likely to have a, have a negative impact um, on the part of the brand. Uh, again, it's very important that we um, conduct product testing alongside concept testing, because uh, there might be issues along the board in your product development. Uh, you might have a fantastic concept, but the product may be uh, dysfunctional and the other way around. self capitalization not only is a bad thing. Uh, if if the, the sales of an extension uh, are high many targets, success may result merely from consumers who are switching from the product brand, in effect cannibalizing it. However, uh, such intra-brand shifts and sales are not undesirable, especially in cases where a competitor would have lost a single line extension anyway. So instead of cannibalizing your own self internally, your competitor would have cannibalized you. So it's better to preempt your competition and foresee the strengths. And this is a very difficult scenario nowadays, especially as they use proliferate. So there's always a significant portion um, of revenues that stems from your own portfolio. And of course, hopefully the biggest portion should start from a competitive portfolio. Uh, this is why it's very important in research terms to conduct an MPD pretesting in order to identify you have the metrics and ways, methods of identifying the source of revenues from your brand and company brand main users. So there's nothing surprising uh, as regards um, brand growth and NPD, provided that you have conducted uh, the correct uh, type of research and to the requisite depth. Um, another major risk is um, uh, with extending, but without having uh, drawn a very clear link with the parent brand. Uh, again, this is likely not to backfire uh, as it does the uh, parent brand, but not to nurture the intended associations for the extension. It's the inverse scenario 
of what I was talking about earlier in terms of harming or not harming the part of the brand. For example, when you let the used minutes, that was the ratio, the human ratio, uh, it might diminish its resonance with a core target audience of men, but at the same time, uh, it might have come across as uh, all for women, given that uh, this brand was extending to a pure male territory. So there are all sorts of questions and issues, again, that must be addressed at the uh, payload phase uh, during the uh, new program testing. Uh, now, the issue in a more environment, and as you can see, the more we uh, are drawing nearer uh, our transition to uh, online and digital branding and the role of digital in MC, the more I will keep cross referring to these examples. In the era of social media, such orthodoxies have begun to crumble in favor of what is called multiformal positionings. That is, the simultaneous positioning of a product in multiple and perhaps potentially conflicting audiences. So, the era of uh, a single mind proposition uh, and a big idea based on a single mind proposition and a USP that was very uh, uh, very strictly defined at the same time with mass appeal uh, is a thing of the past. Nowadays, uh, a brand has to be uh, endorsing, it's uh, obliged to endorse polyphony, but in a manageable manner. And I will come back to this one, we'll be talking about brand communities in the uh, digital branding uh, session in the week's time. Um, another example. Uh, as regards the um, harm that may inflicted to the part of the brand by the land extension, is if customers see the brand extension uh, as inconsistent or conflicting with the corresponding associations with the parent brand. For example, when Heinz uh, introduced the all natural cleaning vinegar, given that the parent brand was uh, well known and reputed for being strictly a food player. The company, the immediate associations that spread the customer's mind, was uh, not a cleaning product, but a meal that included vinegar. Uh, they just couldn't understand it. Uh, again, a uh, way out of the sympas would be to uh, modulate the brand architecture of the brand in such a way as to avoid such issues going forward. This might have been uh, accounted for and accommodated in brand architectural terms if Heinz had included the script of food as an intermediate uh, variable and qualifier uh, for its food products and uh, used another uh, intermediate descriptor such as cleaning products for this category. Uh, the problem was that it extended straight from a brand for the brand brand name without having nurtured uh, category specific associations first among its pros current and prospective clientele and to what extent it is capable and credibly so to compete with these categories. So the more prominent we use an existing brand that has already achieved a certain level of awareness and image. To an extension, the issue should be to create awareness and positive associations in memory. This is the link between brand equity and brand extensions grosser model. Um, now, what kind of elements may be leveraged in this transfer process? Common brand name, marble, marble to marble light, uniform label aesthetics between parent brand and LX. For example, uh, the majority of variants tend to differ in terms of color uh, or some other aspect that is more peripheral to the core branding elements. Then, for example, Doritos has exactly the same placement of the logo of the front of pack, exactly the same measure placement of the key visual of the front of pack, exactly the same placement and font type of the variant of the front of pack. But in different terms of pack colors by flavor. 
So uh, this is a way of uh, maintaining consistency and coherency in a set of terms. This is very important when you choose the learned elements and which ones you will modulate for your line extension. Especially in your written assignment, which includes in the final part uh, the advertising brief and uh, the suggestion about packaging, it's very important to uh, go through these uh, considerations from the main text, from Keller's main text, Strategic Brand Management in your book, in order to understand what kind of variables you have to look at for developing your product. We are not requested by no means to be an expert in broad aesthetics, semiotics, or anything like for your assignment. However, you should uh, grasp to a fair um, to a fair extent by looking at your main text. What kind of uh, design elements must be kept constant? Which may be uh, uh, with which elements you may play around, and how you will attain uh, to maintain parent brand associations, but then reach as well probably the parent brand new associations due to new aesthetics. Again, there's a fine balance between what you bring forward, what you retain, and what you bring uh, into the franchise and new elements. Uh, another example is embedding the um, line extension as a function in a part of brand's advertising. This is a quite usual tactic uh, when it comes to uh, uh, announcing a new line extension against a brown background of a corporate campaign. As so we with discussing greater detail in our IMC part, the uh, emotional conditioning part of advertising as an integral part of creative strategy is uh, at least half um, the uh, half the uh, half the importance for most half the importance as a determinant of the brand success as the claims you will be making about your new brand. So this is a very cunning and uh, fruitful and profitable way of capitalizing on the associations of an emotional related campaign, uh, a brand campaign, by uh, embedding uh, as a function of the landing station um, as a uh, mini DVC. Uh, there's also, also the option of modifying the slogan of the brand brand. Uh, or as key claims, that is, use the same, uh, the same slogan, or play around uh, in such a way uh, as to uh, substitute one or two words, again, maintaining coherence and consistency, but bringing something new as well. Um, now, as it does the determinants of successful land extensions, Randy Hollock and Barrett studied the uh, land extensions um, 75 dollar extensions for 34 secret brands over a 20 year period. And this study culminated in uh, some key findings that are quite sample. Uh, first, the line extensions of strong brands are more successful than extensions of weak brands. The line extensions of both brands enjoy greater market success than those of less involved brands. So, uh, second, leveraging secondary brand associations, of which brand symbol is, is a integral part, is very important. Land extensions that receive strong advertising and formal support are more successful than extensions that receive meager support. Uh, this has also been a key finding uh, for the great market communications. If you start putting the plug uh, behind the main brand, chances are that uh, they uh, communication effort you put behind a new line extension will be less effective. And finally, line extensions that enter early in your product category are more successful than extensions that are later, the so called first mover advantage. And this is why it's very important to foresee the developments in your market across all brand elements in order to be capable of uh, furnishing your brand not only functionally oriented advantages, competitive advantages not be just are the functional advantages and uh, traits, uh, attributes, competence, and so forth. But even more importantly, 
I guess the background of cellular is changing a step for, from your aesthetics of your packaging. Packaging is extremely important. Now, what kind of bases uh, are available for gauging the potential fit between an extension and a panel brand? Again, no rules, but there are some guidelines. And these guidelines, again, tend to be uh, as imaginative as you can make them to be. Example, Fisher Price, uh, it markets fiscally dissimilar toys, uh, bath care and car seats. This then it links together under the umbrella project for children. Typical life state segmentation, or like maybe lifestyle segmentation. There are all sorts of just like there are all sorts of segmentation bases. There are uh, all sorts of effective uh, associated transfers among seemingly uh, discrepant or divergent subcategories by uh, effectively uh, uniting them under an umbrella that comes across as, of course, explainable, that's relevant, and all the rest criteria that must be applied uh, as we discussed earlier. Um, extra consumers are more likely to use technical details and technical information in order to close the level of free period extension and a pilot run, uh, as against novice consumers who are likely to use more peripheral cues, such as package, shape, color, size, and usage. Yet, this tells you that given that the bulk, especially of routine, routine purchase categories, with the bulk of FMCG categories, uh, they're either low or medium involvement depending on uh, its segment, these peripheral cues are even more important in sensitizing uh, your, your core audience. And, um, finally, uh, uh, concrete other associations that be more difficult to extend than abstract benefit associations. This is the um, an extension of the example we were looking at earlier, but from another angle, mm. that is, uh, if your brand is reputed more for its functional performance, then it's much more difficult to extend it than if it's reputed more for uh, more tangible uh, benefits and, uh, and attributes. That is, uh, a trusted brand, a brand you may not know uh, very well the brand is a functional attributes, but you may have uh, either through uh, word of mouth or through participating in peer groups, uh, let's say a very positive idea uh, about this brand. Uh, so it's a brand you trust, even though this is trust at a distance, this is called. This furnishes a much uh, more um, fertile platform for extending uh, as against a scenario of being constrained in a purely functional territory. Um, an example of uh, this scenario is a study by Arthur and Keller, where they examined the uh, potential of Heineken to enter the popcorn category and pressed the potential of entering tuning taps. In the former case, that is the game Heineken, uh, the uh, popcorn was perceived without estimate. This is just conceptual based associations. Uh, it was uh, expected to taste bad or like a beer. And in case of crust, press, uh, it was expected to, the trigger was expected to taste like a toothpaste. So they were both rejected at the conceptual level. And of course, the um, question I would like to pose to everyone at this point, including uh, our internet audience, of course, is whether this should be rejected, this take for example the popcorn, or whether this should be regarded as an opportunity for consumer training. What do you think? Any ideas? Anyways, there's no right or wrong. It depends on the risk the company is uh, prepared to take. For example, uh, um, 
are personally conducting uh, new product development tests for various products, and some of them they failed miserably. Yet they, the, the companies, they decided to launch them, either because of global strategic priorities or they were, because they were very convinced that if they mobilize uh, an army of ambassadors uh, and brand evangelists, they would be capable of reversing this, let's say, initial conceptual deficit. Again, there's no black and white in these cases. Uh, for example, with alcoholic drinks, uh, for a, a new taste is also impossible to build uh, as, uh, in, in terms of embedding in, in uh, drinking habits, consumer drinking habits, unless you mobilize bartenders, provide incentives, you explicitly request that they you know, give away free shots and stuff like that. So trial and uh, extension uh, on-site uh, relevant involvement with the brand is of very, uh, it's of paramount importance for, uh, let's say, overcoming uh, drawbacks that might have been pointed out at the conceptual stage. But this is why it's very, also very important to conduct uh, pre-tests, product pre-tests and trials, both in the functional aspects and even more importantly, these sort of associations, because you then may develop a marketing plan that's exactly geared towards circumventing these perceptual barriers. Um, we skip a slide. I'm yes, uh, I skip a slide. This is a slide that sums up uh, the steps in successful producing branding mm -hmm. sessions. Uh, this is very important for your assignment, but of course I'm not going to read the entire uh, procedure. But uh, you, I included it in your presentation because uh, this, the, the slides, as I've said, on the other hand, some of the main points from your quite bulky book, allegedly. And at the same time, the to provide you guidance as to which are the um, key requirements for your essay in terms of background reading. Uh, so this stepwise procedure is very useful for you. I strongly recommend that you read it uh, when applying and uh, thinking about your plan. And the final bit that I want to discuss about extensions concerns vertical extensions. There are two cases here. The first concerns the extension of a brand upwards, that is, into a more premium market segment, or the opposite scenario of downwards into more value conscious segment. The upper extensions can improve our demands, whereas the premium versions of a convey, sorry, the, the upper extension can improve our demands, whereas uh, a lower uh, price brand that is uh, extended downwards uh, may confer negative uh, associations of imperial quality to the mother brand. And another discussion topic for you, what do you think about uh, strong brands, very well-known brand names, yet which manufacturer labels? This is a very typical case in the majority of the retail, uh, of retailers uh, you, you're shopping from, you're shopping from. Most of these uh, on-label products, the manufacturing, they're actually manufactured by uh, major players. Uh, of course, this is not mentioned on the further part that this is manufactured, for example, uh, our shampoo is manufactured by Unilever. But I mean, if you turn the back of car, in the majority of cases, it does mention the actual company. So, what do you think would be the outcome uh, in terms of associations uh, if you found out that a cheaper brand, all level brand, has been manufactured by your favorite brand, which does, in some cases, sells double the amount of uh, money that's commanded by the private label. Will that backfire? Or the main manufacturer? Would, would that be indifferent? Probably yes, but uh, that's, that's another example of with the private labels. That is a rumor, rumors rumors or reality, we don't know that uh, private labels used to manufacture by strong uh, multinational companies. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. It's not a rumor, that's what I said. It's a standard practice, uh, not all rumor. Because of course, uh, as a company, uh, 
you, you, you might be capable of uh, uh, achieving better prices and raw materials if you uh, produce more than if you have excess capacity compared to what you source through your brands into the market. So if you have the opportunity to uh, manufacture for others in a less conspicuous way, then of course this is uh, going to be more profitable down the line for the company in terms of uh, uh, the supply chain ordering. Or it's a lot more market. profitable. Yes. Because you're yes. skipping all the other factors like the Advertising. marketizing and net. Yeah. So, um, nevertheless, um, the outcomes from surveys and both from academic research and practitioners and research is quite ambivalent. In some cases, more consumers uh, are no less concerned because at the end of the day, many brands feature um, different offers with different segments, starting from cheap offers and moving up to more premium offers mm -hmm. and with a considerable uh, wide price range, a considerable wide price range as well. So at the end of the day, it's like, let's say, comparing between the low end of your portfolio with another uh, brand that uh, happens to be offered, happens to be produced by your uh, corporate brand. Uh, of course, the same happens if that were your own uh, variant or sub brand in your portfolio, that some uh, uh, consumers might be thwarted from really cherishing. Uh, these uh, premium associate premium associations just because you feature a cheaper brand in your portfolio. And of course, it's, I believe it is status on sure. another way for a yeah. consumer to consume, um, let's say, a brand from a, a Unilever and uh, to consume the private label uh, of Sclavanitis and uh, sure. AB. Sure. It's status. But in, in, in some cases, well, those. Surely the case where brand labels, you know, uh, made their first appearance in the market. But right now, it's uh, especially in some categories, brand labels are uh, carry equal equity to national brands. Mm. So uh, this is why I haven't mentioned uh, at all uh, when I was talking about equity that one of the early perspectives of coaching uh, brand equity were the perspective. Uh, was initially developed in the academia was by comparing uh, national brands to what they call no name brands or brand mm -hmm. labels, which of course is not the case because nowadays, and uh, it has been the same for quite a long time now, um, uh, discounters, both soft and hard discounters, they carry uh, definitely some equity, and in some cases, uh, what we call gravitas. To other retailers. For example, Lidl, uh, as you can uh, understand, uh, is, 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 is hard to counter, but in some categories, in other categories, it's either on parity or even more expensive than uh, national and uh, than other retailers. But at the same time, it tends to, you know, um, maintain this, let's say, conflicting Positioning on the one hand, it features premium products, highly priced on its shelves, and at the same time, it features considerably lower priced brands to uh, standard, to standard uh, uh, retailer. And another example, I believe it is the that the, the Mercedes Benz on the small, uh, smart, uh, not the smart. Not smart, uh, like oh, right. a class yeah, yeah. GLA, the motor range is it's, yeah. it's manufactured by Renault. <laughs> it's the same right. motor range with the Clio Capture uh, models yeah. right now. But you prefer to buy uh, Benz. and drive in uh, Benz, uh, even if the, the many and main parts of the car is not created by, by, yeah. by, by, by Mercedes. Sure. But you feel that you're driving in Benz. In Benz. Excellent sound. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, in the hotel center, this is exactly the same strategy that's implemented by all day. Mm -hmm. We said, as I mentioned, it's uh, 
clientele into five different types of hotels, starting with the upscale Crown Plaza, which is the only uh, hotel that doesn't feature the name Holiday Inn, but still it's run by Holiday Inn. Has completely differentiated the very upscale uh, part of its uh, business by not featuring its corporate name. However, it, for the rest four times, uh, it, it, it follows uh, a burning house approach, that's the traditional whole day, the budget whole day express, the business oriented whole day select, and whole day hotel and suites. Right, um, now we have been talking all along about Bravo stations from a uh, product centric point of view, that is from the point of view of brands themselves, how associations work, how they transfer, uh, what are the risks and opportunities for effective transfers, or from a consumer's point of view as a pro individual processing model uh, of information that is the psychological, the eco-psychological model that is dominant uh, in uh, the brand equity perspective. From a more expanded social, psychological and social, sociological and anthropological point of view, uh, it's very important to incorporate this perspective because the meaning, at the end of the day, the source of the meaning of associations, whether these are uh, cultural values or aesthetic aspects, they tend to adhere in a cultural constituted world. So the meaning here is out there in society, it's not generated inside consumers' minds to begin with. And if it, if it does, it's always a variation of the meaning of one or more meanings that flowed in society. Uh, this is the uh, cultural branding, one of the, let's say, more foundational cultural branding approaches to brand management, and it's especially relevant for brand equity, uh, because it tells, as you can, tells us, as you can see from the uh, diagram on the right-hand right -hand side, that meaning is transferred from a culturally constituted world towards different cultural practices and orders, whether this is the fashion system or consumer goods, via different rituals that is possessing, changing, grooming, and investing, in which the individual consumer participates. So meaning is generated in a participatory fashion through successive transfers from a macroculture to one individual monads. And it's very important for your pastel because this blueprint, blueprint allows you to appreciate all the other more nuanced approaches of mapping the source of transfer, which I will be talking about next week. But it's a, a, a very, let's say, uh, um, foundational way of appreciating how uh, values and other aspects of uh, uh, brand associations originate from a socially constructed world and through rituals that become inscribed in consumers' consciousness. So what we saw is what we saw as a brand of structure, at the end of the day, is a kind of culmination of a long process that starts with macrocultural aspects. This way, your best is very, very important uh, for calling your brand later on. Now, in these terms, uh, there are two levels of congruence. First, the congruency. Um, they will be a cultural value, for example, the scale is and a consumer segment, which means that uh, if the scale is, is valued by consumer segment X, then they're more likely to consume uh, adventures and other experiential events. So again, it's, this is not a decision 
as a, an antecedent that stems from within a consumer uh, through a psychological process. Although, of course, psychological process takes place as decision making, but the very source uh, from where from this value stems is a country at large. And congress between a brand and the selected consumer value uh, or its line extension. Uh, these are two different layers of congruency uh, and at the same time on the inverse of uh, identifying what, whether there might be any congress or any disorder or discrepancy because the, you might deem that the cultural value is very relevant for you, you will have succeeded in your first uh, step of this asset test, but the brand is not very successful in meeting this value that we value. Um, right, so it's working by stay. Let's take a very, very quick break, five minutes, and continue with the final part 